Hey, Cypher here. This is actually part five of a California history series that I've been doing. You can click here to start the playlist if you would like. You don't necessarily have to go and see those, but context is always a good thing, but this could easily be viewed in isolation. Anyways, on with the show. Things were beginning to calm down after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in February of 1848. California had been organized as a military governorship to make way for it becoming a territory of the United States. The long and crazy history of California was ready to calm down into the steady buildup of an agricultural territory and eventual statehood. But events were already transpiring that would bring the biggest tumult of that history. After having been in a state of perpetual revolution, ending with an outright war between countries, how could anything be more tumultuous than that? Well, it starts on a sawmill of all places. A man named James Marshall had built a sawmill for John Sutter's fort on the south fork of the American River. He had been one of the bear flaggers during the war, and he returned to operate the sawmill. Because he worked with water there to do the milling, he noticed a few chunks of shiny stuff in it, and eventually happened upon a rather large chunk of gold. It was fortuitous timing, because the war with Mexico was about to officially end, with California being annexed as a possession of the United States. It took time for the news to reach outside. The only Californian newspaper didn't publish the discovery for months. American generals who were in charge of the territory tried to spread the news, but it took almost a year before the rest of America was aware of the discovery. In 1849, thousands of people traveled from all around the world to take advantage of the discovery. At first, they were called Argonauts, but they were eventually called 49ers because of the year that they came to California in droves to try to strike it rich. Now, before we get carried away, since many people view the gold rush as somewhat miraculous timing for the fledgling American West, I do want to point out that there had already been a very minor gold rush in Alta California back in 1842, where a prospector had discovered gold near a tree he had been napping under. It's literally called the Tree of the Golden Dream now. But because of the way that the Mexican land grant system worked, and the lack of publishing at that time, it was a very limited rush. Although it was still being worked by a few in 1847, when Sutter and Marshall possibly traveled through there on their way back from the California War, since they had both been bear flaggers. 1849 began a population explosion. In little over a year, the population of California multiplied it almost 10 times. Just imagine the craziness such an expansion brings along with it. Some people came by land across the United States or from elsewhere, but the vast majority came by ship. Despite having to go all the way around South America at that point in time, it was still faster and often cheaper to go by ship. Many were not American either, coming from all around the world. All of them brought the baggage of historical context along for the ride. So California became a crazy place during the gold rush, especially since it was so far away from the federal government. These Argonauts scoured the gold fields of the Sierra Nevadas for gold. Initially, they simply panned for gold. They were hardly digging anything, mostly trying to get what they could from the banks of rivers, streams, and creeks. This is called placer mining and it continued for over a year until the prospects of such mining were diminishing. But they weren't done using natural waterways. Instead, they used pressurized water to blast rocks and put the stream of debris through rockers, just as they had while they were placer mining. This hydraulic mining would leave tailings of debris and utterly destroy the environment. But it was highly effective at eking out every ounce of gold possible. It was a truly industrial process. By the mid-1850s, mining was essentially a corporate effort, no longer the realm of prospectors, though there would be periodic rushes for other minerals and different Californian gold fields. Before it was corporatized, the onslaught of prospectors and people trying to make money off of those prospectors made California a wild place, so government tried to rein it in. California's military governorship struggled to maintain control, 
It was essentially direct federal control, but a message from the federal government took more than a month to be received. By 1849, for the first and only time in American history, an American general ordered the creation of a state government. Local leaders from across California formed a constituent assembly in late 1849 and drafted a constitution. Now keep in mind, they were doing this before the federal congress had even heard what was going on. So all of it was of their own accord. In that state constitution, it stated that California would not be a slave state. Essentially, they told the Federal Congress what to do before they could act, and created the movement for popular sovereignty that would lead to bleeding Kansas and eventually the American Civil War. The Compromise of 1850 was specifically to deal with what California had basically demanded through her constitution. Furthermore, California also defined her own boundaries. These things were unheard of. Congress was supposed to do that. But with all that gold flowing, who could stop them? California was off in its own little world, the first state west of Texas, with plenty of territory in between. It was quicker to go to China in those days than to receive word from the federal government. And since the military governorship was abolished with the state constitution, California was its own wild state beyond federal reach. With that lack of federal oversight came a lack of law. You can still see the remnants of this wild past in the county geography of the state. There are little counties which today seem to have no reason to be separate, but were distinct in the 1850s because of various mining towns that are halfway deserted today by comparison. It was difficult to govern, especially with the rapidly increasing population. Since gold was free flowing from the mines, the state government being in a fledgling position, and the population was so incredibly diverse, crime was rampant. It was said that every man carried a gun, and the incidents of dueling and murder were certainly higher than anywhere in the US. Murder and robbery hit epidemic proportions. This is the time of famous banditos like Joaquin Marietta, Solomon Pico, Jack Powers, Juan Flores, and so many others. It was so bad that many called the decade the Bloody Fifties, as in 1850s. The gold rush was inaugurated in violence by the murder of 10 people at Mission San Miguel by a gang of hatchet-wielding thieves one night in 1848, which was put down by angry posse members. One of the gang members had committed the first murder of the gold rush just a few weeks prior in the initial diggings at Sutter's Mill. People would periodically take matters into their own hands when they felt that the state or local government was incapable of upholding the law. They formed what were called vigilance committees, which were massive organizations to mete out justice outside the confines of the law, mostly with deadly force. Although San Francisco was awfully fond of just exiling people. These vigilantes were meant to pacify a crime-ridden California through violence supposedly sanctioned by the popular will of the people. Whether or not they succeeded is up for debate. California experienced other mineral rushes after the 1849 gold rush, but the 49ers were the biggest wave. California's role in American mineral extraction steadily changed over the bloody 50s though. It became more and more of a gateway to the west. Since it was easier to travel by ship and then make your way inland at that point in time, people going elsewhere in the west stopped in California on their way inland. The tidings of the west were tied to California, yet the state remained distinctly separate from the other states. It was a lonely outpost of statehood among territorial governments until 1859, when Oregon joined the Union as a free state. That year, the Comstock load was hit in Nevada, and California being the gateway of the West took part in that rush. And soon, where that was would become the state of Nevada, during the Civil War. Western states weighed heavily in the growing debate over slavery that was developing in the East and would eventually explode into the Civil War in the 1860s. That war transformed California. But that story will have to wait for another episode. So be sure to subscribe to catch that once I get to it. And I'll see you next time.